Welcome back to this introductory statistics course. Today marks the first session of our mini section on psychometrics. Specifically, we will discuss reliability and validity. In the social sciences, we often use questionnaires to assess different traits of our participants. So what is a questionnaire? A questionnaire is a written set of questions that are given to people in order to collect facts or opinions about something. A questionnaire could measure, for example, self-reported behavior. And in this case, you would want to make the question very specific with a clearly defined time frame. For example, asking participants, how often did you visit the gym in the past seven days? It's also possible to ask people about their beliefs. For example, you might ask them, do you think going to the gym is healthy or not? You can also ask people about their knowledge. For example, you can ask them how many calories are burned during a 30-minute jog. You can ask for opinions, values, or attitudes. For example, do you think the average person should go to the gym more? And you can ask about your participants' attributes or characteristics. For example, what is your body weight? When administering questionnaires, we have to think about what response options we will allow. Here are several examples. One example is a binary ordinal response option. In this case, the question is, do you enjoy statistics? And participants can either respond not at all or very much. This is a binary response option. Now, you might already feel like a lot of nuance is lost by just using these two response options. So let's consider an alternative. One very common way to assess attitudes and opinions is with a Likert scale. This is a type of ordinal scale with labels at the extreme ends where people can indicate how strongly they agree with a statement. For example, here the statement is, how much do you enjoy statistics? And participants are asked to respond on a five-point scale ranging from not at all to very much and I guess that values in the middle are somewhere between not at all and very much. So maybe the middle is kind of neutral. This is an ordinal measurement level scale because we have five consecutively ordered response options. But another option is to use what's called a visual analog scale. And this is an attempt at making the scale continuous. So here we ask the same question, how much do you enjoy statistics? still with the same labels on the extremes of the response scale, but now participants just put a check mark somewhere along this line, supposedly to indicate how strongly they agree with this statement. So in this case, this person felt a little bit more positive than neutral about statistics. And someone who would put a tick mark here would feel pretty negatively about statistics. So, we can say that this skill is continuous, but can we actually say that it's interval measurement level, that a distance from here to here is equally large as a distance from, say, here to here? That's kind of difficult to assess. So that takes us back to measurement level, which was the topic of our very first lecture of this course. And remember that the measurement level of a variable determines what kind of information that variable conveys. So we can ask the question, are opinions, values, and dispositions, are they interval or ratio variables? I would propose that very often we actually don't know what the measurement level of a variable is. So if we use a continuous scale to measure opinions, values, and dispositions, can we then assume an interval or ratio measurement level? Well, maybe not. So the take home message here is that just because you use, for example, a visual analog scale, doesn't mean that you can assume that the underlying variable is either interval or ratio. And just because you use an ordinal Likert scale, doesn't mean that you can assume that the underlying variable is ordinal. Let's consider a counter example as well. So here we're measuring a variable that is truly of ratio measurement level income in euros. But we've measured that with a Likert scale. We ask participants, what is your monthly salary? And they can select one out of five response options, zero to 1,000 euros, 1,000 to 2,000 euros, 
2,000 to, I guess this should be 3,000 euros, 3,000 to 4,000 and more than 4,000 euro. So in this case, even though the variable has a ratio measurement level, we've measured it with a Likert scale and therefore we only have ordinal measurement level data about this ratio variable. Just to sum this up, in practice we will often assume a particular measurement level for our variables. But be mindful that you are implicitly making this assumption depending on your choice of response options. Violating the assumption of a particular measurement level may bias the result of your analysis. So it is useful to reflect on any assumptions you make about measurement in your discussion when you're writing a report. Let's also recap what we discussed in lecture one about constructs and variables. Recall from lecture one that a construct is an abstract feature of interest for the population. For example, we might conduct a study on short-term memory or intelligence or perseverance or education. Within that study, we have to use an operational definition in order to be able to measure that property in all of our participants. So, an operational definition is a concrete, measurable representation of the construct. For example, we can measure short-term memory with the number of words recalled after a fixed time interval. We can measure intelligence with the validated Wexler Adult Intelligence Scale. We can measure perseverance by assessing how long our participants are able to withstand a tasty treat and we can measure education by asking them about the highest degree they've obtained. And now I want to introduce a new distinction, which is between observed versus latent constructs. Observed constructs are those that could theoretically be measured directly. For example, we have people's height, their weight, their age, how often they visit the gym in the past seven days, these are all observable constructs. And if we ask people about these constructs in questionnaires, they might have some slight measurement error. For example, if I ask about how often people visit the gym in the past week, they might misremember one or two times. But by and large, it's still reasonable to assume that this type of variable is observed with negligible measurement. This is in contrast to so-called latent constructs because latent constructs can only be measured indirectly. For example, attitudes, beliefs and opinions are all things that only exist in your participants' heads and there are no rulers or measuring tapes to measure people's attitudes. Instead, we have to come at them indirectly and typically we use questionnaires for that purpose. Social science very often uses latent constructs. For example, a researcher might claim that extroverted people make successful managers. This statement contains two latent variables, because what is an extrovert? We have to measure that property of the individual indirectly. And what is a successful manager? We have to look at indicators of their success within their organization. Now, you could use one or more observed indicators to measure whether someone is a successful manager or not. For example, we can measure that person's income and just define success on the individual level. A successful manager is one with a high income. Or we could measure it in a more inclusive way by looking at the number of positive reviews that manager received from the people that they manage. But how do you measure a personality trait like extroversion? Well, here we use indicators. We use observable indicators of the unobservable latent construct. For example, you could imagine that extroverted people probably have more friends than introverted people, that they probably tend to go out more often, that they probably enjoy skydiving more and knitting less. Together, all of these observed indicators help us capture the underlying latent construct of extroversion. And these are the basic principles of classical test theory. Classical test theory assumes that observed test scores are a function of an underlying true score plus measurement error. So in this case, we could say that people's observed responses to these three statements are a function of their true score on extroversion 
and some measurement error, which is specific to the individual, and that specific indicator. Now, this is a theoretical model, but in actual reality, we often don't know the exact impact of measurement error on observed indicators. So how should we think about this measurement error? Well, let me give you a very concrete example. If you drive on the highway and you set your cruise control for 102, 103 kilometers per hour on a road with a speed limit of 100 kilometers per hour, you probably won't get a ticket. Why is this? Because whenever they measure your speed, they assume that the measurement error is probably larger than about three kilometers per hour. So they don't have definitive proof that you're exceeding the speed limit if you're exceeding it by less than the assumed measurement error. In the context of questionnaires, there are many factors that influence measurement error. If I'm measuring people's heights, then measurement error will include, for example, people's posture. Are they slouching or are they stretching? Possibly, it could be influenced by whether people wear shoes or not and whether those shoes are Nike Air Max with thick soles or whether they are barefoot shoes with no sole at all. But measurement error is also influenced by what kind of instrument I use. For example, I might have a very basic measurement of height where I just put some notches on a doorpost and I ask people to stand next to the doorpost and I say, well, you're up to the fifth notch on my doorpost, which is a very coarse measurement. Or I might have a very fine grained measurement by using a tailor's tape measure that I hold up next to the person. We can apply these same principles to latent constructs. For example, assume that my true score on extroversion is pretty high. So when I read a question that says, I enjoy talking with people, I'm inclined to respond pretty favorably. However, my response will also be influenced by random factors. For example, after a sleepless night, my response will be slightly less enthusiastic. So measurement error would then lead to an underestimation of my extroversion score. That difference between my true score on extroversion and my response on the specific item is called measurement error. But also the selection of questions in my questionnaire will have an influence. For example, if my type of extroversion is primarily reflected in gregariousness, but the questionnaire that I'm filling in mostly focuses on assertiveness, then my extroversion will be underestimated. Let's assume that we've collected people's responses to several items on a questionnaire. How do we consolidate their responses to all those items into a scale score? Well, one very straightforward way is just to calculate a sum score across all the items that are supposed to measure the same underlying latent construct. The formula for a sum score looks like this. The sum score is a sum across all items, one through K, of the observed individual scores on those items. So let's say we have a four question questionnaire to measure whether people like statistics or not. Every question can be answered with a three category Likert scale. So it's an ordinal questionnaire. So the first question is, statistics are really cool, disagree, neutral, or agree? And this person responded, agree. The second question is, I find statistics books boring. This person disagreed. The third question is, SPSS makes me happy. This person disagreed. And the fourth question is, studying statistics makes me happy. This person agreed. So if we treat the three response categories as numbers, one, two, and three, then we could simply calculate a sum score. Three plus one plus one plus three equals eight. Yes, that's how you calculate a sum score, but notice the following. This question is phrased exactly the opposite direction from all of the other questions. And that's called a contraindicative item. A statement whose wording is aligned with the direction of the construct, so here we're measuring love of statistics, and any question that is positively phrased about statistics is indicative, but any statement whose wording is opposed to the construct we're measuring 
is contraindicative. So if we're measuring love of statistics and the question says, I find statistics boring, that is reverse coded or contraindicative relative to the rest of the scale. So that means that even though the person responded with a one here, we should actually treat it as the highest possible score. In other words, we should reverse code their answers before we calculate the sum score. So let's do that. Instead of adding plus one for the person's response to this question, we will add plus three. And now this person's sum score is a 10. So in general, when we're reverse coding categorical items for a contraindicative item X with K response categories, the reverse coded item X sub R is equal to the number of categories plus one minus the observed score. So here the scale maximum is three and this person scored a one. So if we take three plus one minus their observed score of one, then we get the reverse coded score, which is three. Some scores are very often used, but they do have some limitations. One limitation is that the total value of the sum depends in part on the number of items. If you have more items, then the sum can be bigger than if you have few items. Relatedly, if any person has a missing value for one of the items, they can't get any points for that missing item, so that person will have a lower score because of the missingness, not because they score lower on the latent construct. Two other limitations are that each item is considered to be equally important if we just sum across all items, and measurement error is ignored. It becomes part of the sum score. It's baked into that sum score. Some of these limitations can be addressed by calculating a mean score instead of a sum score. And the formula for calculating mean scores is given here. The mean score x sub mean is equal to a sum of the individual item scores across all items divided by the total number of valid items for that participant. The advantage is that the range of values here no longer depends on the number of items. So if all of your items are on a five point scale, then the mean score will also range on that five point scale. Then the range of the mean score will also fall on that five point scale. So the range of the scale remains the same as the range of the items. Furthermore, if you divide by the total number of valid items for every participant, then missing values no longer result in a lower score. But two remaining limitations are that each item is still considered to be equally important and measurement error is still ignored. So mean scores are somewhat better than some scores, but not in all respects. Now that you understand that we can create scale scores that represent latent constructs based on responses to several observed indicators, I want to talk to you about reliability and validity, two properties of the measurement of a latent construct. Very simply put, reliability means that we are able to measure the same thing consistently, and validity means that we measure the thing that we intended to measure. Note that reliability is a necessary condition for validity. If we measure something different each time that we measure, that measurement cannot be valid. But reliability is not a sufficient condition for validity. So just because we have a reliable measurement doesn't mean that that also measures the thing that we intended to measure. And I think the bullseye is a very useful metaphor to understand how this works. So in the top left here, we see an instrument that is reliable but not valid. And in the center of the bull's eye here is the latent construct that we want to measure. Every dot here symbolizes one question in our questionnaire. And you can think of these as darts being thrown towards the center of the bull's eye. But as you see, all of the darts hit pretty much in the same place, but way off the center of the bullseye. 
So these different items consistently measure something, it's just not the thing that we wanted to measure. So this is a reliable questionnaire, but not a valid questionnaire. In the top right, we see an example of a reliable questionnaire that is also valid. So here, each of the dots that reflect the items in our questionnaire are clustered very closely together, which means that they are reliable, and they also cluster around the bullseye, which means that they are valid. In the bottom left, we see a scale that is unreliable and not valid. So all of the items are quite dispersed. Each of them measures something slightly different and all of them are far away from the center of the bullseye. So this questionnaire is neither reliable nor valid. And then in the bottom right, we see a questionnaire where even though all of the items are on average clustered around the center of the bullseye, every single one of them is quite far away. So it is unreliable and for that reason it is not valid. So we define reliability as an instrument's property of consistently measuring the same thing. This is related to classical test theory. A reliable instrument has low measurement error relative to the true score variance. There are different ways to define reliability. One way is to define it as test-retest reliability. In this case, the question is, are individual scores similar across multiple measurement occasions? So for example, if you fill out a questionnaire on extroversion right now and you score pretty high, will you also score pretty high a month from now? A different way to define reliability is in terms of internal consistency. And this means, are the scores across different questions similar within an individual? So for example, if you score high on I like parties, do you then also score high on I enjoy going out? And a third way to define reliability is as inter-rater reliability. Do people, do different people report the same score for the same thing? If we asked two of your classmates to tell us how extroverted they think you are, do they give similar ratings? How can we estimate reliability? Well, there are different ways. We have so-called reliability coefficients for each of these different types of reliability that I just introduced. In general, this all comes down to the fact that we try to estimate the association between repeated assessments of the test. In the case of test-retest reliability, that means between repeated administrations of the same test over time. In the case of internal consistency, that means between different items of the same test. And in terms of inter-rater reliability, that means the association between the scores of different raters of the same construct of interest. And this is grayed out because it falls outside of the scope of this course. Now, in general, all of these different reliability coefficients are essentially correlation coefficients and their values should be positive. So there should be a positive association between repeated administrations of the same test. How do we compute, for example, test-retest reliability? Well, it's quite simple. You administer the same test to the same participants two times, and then you calculate a correlation between their repeated scores. So the correlation R between the scores X at time one and the scores X at time two. And this is pretty useful for traits that are assumed to be stable like extroversion and other personality traits. There are some limitations of calculating test-retest reliability, however. One limitation is the so-called learning effect. After participants have been exposed to your questionnaire once, they might be familiar with the questions and therefore respond differently to them the second time. Another limitation is memory effects. People may respond similarly to the same questions not because their underlying traits state the same, but because they simply remember how they previously answered and they want to be consistent. 
The opposite is also possible. If you take a break between two measurements, it's possible that the underlying true score has changed over time. And in that case, the test-retest reliability would go down, but not because your questionnaire is unreliable, but because your participants are changing. So the trick is to find an interval that is just long enough for participants to be minimally affected by learning and memory, but still short enough for minimal change in the underlying latent construct to occur. We can estimate reliability in terms of the internal consistency of a questionnaire in several ways as well. One way is the so-called split halves method. In this case, we would split the same test into two halves. So we just take half of the items of the questionnaire and the other half of items of the questionnaire. And then we correlate the scores of the first half with those of the second half. So we calculate the correlation R of the scores X of the first half with the scores X on the second half. Now this gives you the correlation between two half tests and it is then customary to apply a correction to try to estimate the reliability of the entire test based on this correlation between the two halves. And that correction is very simple. Take the split half correlation R, multiply it by two and divide it by one minus R. And that gives you the estimated split halves reliability. But perhaps the most well-known estimator of internal consistency is called Kronbach's alpha. Kronbach's alpha also estimates reliability as internal consistency, and it estimates it across all of the items in your scale. This is the formula for Kronbach's alpha. You don't need to memorize it, but I do want to point out a few things. So in this formula, we take the number of items k and multiply it by the average covariance between items. So the numerator here is going to be large if the average covariance between items is high. So if the items tend to correlate strongly, the numerator is going to be high. But the numerator is also going to be high if there are very many items, because the number of items factors into the calculation here. And that is then divided by this term. So in this term, we see the average variance of items plus the number of items minus one times the average covariance between items. And this term is just there to standardize this term and make sure that it always falls on a scale from zero to one. Note that if you want to calculate Kronbach's alpha, contraindicative items must be reverse coded. If there is one negatively worded item there, that's going to severely lower the average covariance between items because that reverse coded item would have a negative covariance with all of the other items. So Kronbach's alpha has several properties. If alpha is high, that means that the average covariance between items is high relative to the average item variance. A high Kronbach's alpha also means that the relationships between items account for most of the item variability. In other words, the error variance is pretty low. But importantly, we are using the average covariance here. And that means that we assume that each item is exactly equally relevant for the underlying scale score. Very often, that might not be the case. Some items might be more indicative of the property that we're trying to measure than other items. We can think of two ways to increase the value of Kronbach's alpha. One is to ensure that the covariances between items are higher, and we can do that by making the items more similar. The problem, however, is that we might lower some of the content validity of our skill if our items are really similar. So if we have a skill that goes, I enjoy going out, I like going out, I love going out, those three items are going to correlate very strongly. So we get a very high Kronbach's alpha, but that's not measuring extroversion, that's just measuring the same thing about going out over and over and over again. And interestingly, we can also increase the value of Kronbach's alpha by including more items in our scale. And this is kind of suspicious. So one thing that I always wonder, if we look at old scales from psychology in like the 60s, 70s, and 80s, 
we often see that they use like 30 or more items to measure the same construct. And I just wonder, is that because they're trying to get a high estimate of Kronbach's alpha? Wouldn't it be better to get a reliable measurement with fewer indicators? Of course, there are also rules of thumb for interpreting Kronbach's alpha. So if we want to know if a scale is reliable, we can follow these rules of thumb. The most important cutoff is around 0.70 here because we consider scales with a Kronbach's alpha greater than 0.70 to have acceptable reliability. Another concept that is often mentioned in association with Kronbach's alpha as an estimator of internal consistency is the item total correlation of individual items with the total scale score. So what does this mean? Well, imagine that we could compute the total scale score by one of the two methods that I explained earlier. We could either create a sum score of all of the responses, or we could take a mean score of all of the item responses. Each item in the scale should measure the same construct as that total score. And to verify that, we could calculate the correlation between each item and that total scale score. Now, of course, if we calculate the correlation between an item and a scale score that was calculated in part based on that item, there will be a positive correlation because we're correlating the item with itself, basically. To prevent that from happening, we can exclude the item for which we're currently calculating the correlation from the total score. And this is called the corrected item total correlation. In other words, that's the correlation of an item with a scale score excluding that item. What we would hope to find is that every individual item has similar item total correlations, because that would mean that each item is indeed equally diagnostic, which was one of the assumptions of Kronbach's alpha. Moreover, if the scale is reliable, then those item total correlations should be pretty high. If there is a low correlation, for example, smaller than 0.30 between an item and the total scale score, that could indicate a problem with the item. And if all of the item total correlations are low, then we probably have an unreliable scale. Another useful concept to consider is how high would Kronbach's alpha be if we removed a specific item from the scale? Ideally, the reliability should remain pretty much the same or even decrease if we remove specific items. But on the other hand, if we observe that Kronbach's alpha would increase substantially, for example, by 0.1 or more, if we were to delete an item, then that might also indicate that there's a problem with that specific item. So let's look at some output of the reliability of a specific six item scale. And I apologize for the blurriness of this picture. I think it's pretty old. So here we have a scale with six items. We see that the estimate of Kronbach's alpha is 0.665, so that rounds to 0.67. If we go back to the rules of thumb we saw earlier, then we realize that this scale has questionable reliability. And then we can further diagnose the scale by looking at the item total correlations. So those are given in this column. So we're looking at the corrected item total correlations. That's the correlation of each item with a scale score excluding itself. So this value of 0.398 or 0.4 is the correlation of this item with the average scale score computed out of all of the other items. And this value, 0.359, is the correlation of this item with a scale score calculated out of the first item and the third up until the sixth item, excluding the second one. So what we see here is that all of these corrected item total correlations are actually pretty close to 0.40. So they're all around the same size, which means that every item is actually pretty much equally diagnostic. And if we look at the Kronbach's alpha if item deleted, then we see that 
for all of the items, it is the case that Kronbach's alpha would decrease if we deleted that item. So I don't see any reason to be concerned about any of these individual items. The scale has low reliability, but I don't think there is a single item to blame. So an alternative explanation might be that the measurement error is pretty high for all of these items. You may wonder, how do I decide if I want to drop items from my scale or not? Should we use, for example, the item total correlation and alpha if item deleted as criteria to remove individual items from the scale? Well, if you're developing a new scale, then this can be a very useful method. But also consider the content validity. Removing one specific item might mean you no longer measure a particular aspect of the construct that you're interested in. But if we are working with previously validated scales that other researchers have developed, then maybe we shouldn't be removing items to begin with, because that causes us to lose comparability of our results to previous studies that have used the same scale. When we drop items, our scale is no longer the same, so we can't compare it straightforwardly. The last topic I want to discuss in more detail is the validity of scales. Does the scale measure what it's supposed to measure? This is also related to test theory, because validity tells us whether we are measuring the true score T or not. Again, there are different definitions of validity. One form of validity is called face validity. At first glance, just reading the items, does this questionnaire appear to assess the correct construct? For example, if I want to measure extraversion, and one of the questions is, I enjoy swimming, does that item have face validity? Does it seem to relate to extraversion? Probably not. A second definition of validity is content validity. Does the test cover all aspects of the construct? So for example, extraversion has a gregariousness aspect, but it also has an assertiveness aspect. Are both of these aspects covered by the questions we ask of our participants? And a third definition of validity is criterion validity. Is the test meaningfully associated with outcomes or indicators of the construct that it's designed to measure? So for example, a questionnaire of extroversion should probably be pretty good at predicting someone's total number of friends. Let's dig a little deeper into face validity. Face validity relates to whether the items are clearly related to the construct of interest, but it also relates to whether the wording of the items is clear, is readable, is understandable for our target audience, and is unambiguous. For example, compare I enjoy going to parties to I enjoy going to parties and talking to people there. This second question is much more ambiguous, because if you read the first half of the sentence, I enjoy going to parties, and you are thinking about dance parties, then maybe it doesn't make much sense to go there to talk to people because of the loud music. But if you read this and you're thinking of birthday parties, it makes a lot of sense to be talking to people there. So this second question has lower face validity because it is more ambiguous and it's like a conjunction of two distinct statements. Another aspect of face validity is whether the answer categories are clearly labeled consistent and unambiguous. So here's an example. I took a picture of a questionnaire that was handed out to me at a theater performance in the United States, and I thought it was pretty great for this course. So the organizers of the event asked the following. When I remember a significant moment in the performance, I was, and then a six-point Likert scale ranging from challenged to affirmed. And the second question is, I feel, again, a six-point Likert scale ranging from lighter to heavier. All right, there's a lot to unpack here. Let's dig into it. First of all, this questionnaire is asking me about a significant moment in the performance. 
what is a significant moment? How should I decide what moments are significant? Even if I can pick a moment that I consider significant, every person filling out this questionnaire will be thinking about a different moment. So their answers are not comparable. And then secondly, every moment could be significant for different reasons. So this was a performance of a Shakespeare play. A moment could be significant because it's romantic or because it's violent or because it's comedic. There are lots of different reasons why a moment might be significant. And then secondly, what are these questions actually asking? For example, the question, I was. What construct underlies I was? It's not clear. Same for I feel. I guess that relates to emotion, but then I have a hard time integrating that with the response options, which are lighter and heavier. Is lighter a feeling? Is heavier a feeling? It's ambiguous. Now that's all about the content of these questions. Let's look at the design of the questionnaire. For the first question, we have a Likert scale, which is labeled at the two extremes. And the one side of the continuum is challenged and the other side of the continuum is affirmed. Are challenged and affirmed antonyms? Are they opposite sides of a spectrum? Is it not possible for me to feel challenged by something and at the same time feel affirmed because I take pride in being challenged and overcoming challenges? Another problem with the design here is that what appears to be the midpoint of the scale is actually a score above average. Physically, this checkbox is exactly in the middle between challenged and affirmed, but that checkbox is labeled four. So if I want to communicate that I had a neutral feeling somewhere between challenged and affirmed, which checkbox should I fill out? If I fill out the middle point on the scale four, then I'm actually saying that I'm more affirmed than challenged. So if you wanted to manipulate people's responses intentionally, this would be a great way to bias their answers. Also, we could ask, should we perhaps provide a neutral middle point at all? Because there are six response options, so by definition, three of them fall below the middle point and three of them fall above the middle point, and there is no possibility to indicate that you felt neutral. So if we just add one more response category, then people can say that they had a neutral feeling or being. And this one really bugs me for some reason. If we look at the two scales, it seems like the meaning of the scale labels is reversed between the two items. So for the first item, we have challenged on the left and affirmed on the right. I personally feel like challenged has a more negative connotation and affirmed has a more positive connotation. And then for the second questionnaire, we have lighter on the left and heavier on the right. And I feel that lighter has a more positive connotation and heavier has a more negative connotation. And by flipping these, there's a risk that we will confuse our participants and that their response options will actually be reversed from what they actually wanted to answer. I hope you enjoyed that real life example. Okay, now let's get into the second type of validity, content validity. How do we determine what aspects of a construct should be covered? Determining this typically involves bringing together panels of experts who then define the full scope of the construct and its subdomains through discussion and who generate items to measure each subdomain of the construct and who rate the relevance of all of the generated items to end up selecting a smaller subset that will make it into the questionnaire. I also want to give a real world example of poor content validity, but here I want to give a trigger warning. This is going to get deeply offensive, but it's absolutely based on real research. If you look into the history of standardized intelligence tests, you will find that it is very closely linked with eugenics research and the belief in the superiority of one race of people over others. So I just want to take a moment and acknowledge the inherently racist roots of intelligence testing. That doesn't mean that there is no merit in intelligence testing, but it does mean that we have to reflect very critically on its history and on the meaning of different kinds of tests.
The first large-scale administration of an intelligence test was in 1917, when the United States Army tested 1,750,000 men enlisted. One conclusion of this test was that white Americans scored on average the highest on this test, followed by white immigrants, and this is a literal quote, the study classified a full 89% of African Americans as, quote, morons, a term, of course, we would consider deeply offensive nowadays. So here's a literal citation of their conclusion. These results are now definitively known to measure native intellectual ability. So the authors claim that this intelligence test measures not only intelligence, but also proves that intelligence is innate, that we're born with it. They are, to some extent, influenced by educational acquirement, so small argument to nurture there, but in the main, the soldier's inborn intelligence determines his mental rating. So this study really tries to lend credence to a racist argument that white people are more intelligent than black people. After the Second World War, people in general, and scientists as well, began to look more critically at these racist ideas. But it took until the 1980s for people to completely tear down the credibility of this study from 1917. And if you want to read that, I found it quite enjoyable. The link to the criticism of the original study is on the screen. What's the problem with the content validity of this test? Well, let's look at some example items of this racist intelligence test. This is a picture completion task. And in this picture, people have to complete the missing part. So I guess the first one is pretty universal. This guy seems to be missing a mouth. This woman seems to be missing an eye. This woman seems to be missing a nose. Here it's already a little bit more ambiguous. What is this person missing? Are they missing a hand or are they missing a spoon? Maybe they're eating something. Pretty ambiguous. Then for the second one, we see a very typical single family dwelling, which would have been common in 1917 amongst white Americans, because they had the privilege of owning their own homes. So what is missing here? I personally can't tell, because homes in the Netherlands don't look like this. So that seems to have a strong cultural factor. Here's a rabbit, I guess, it's missing an ear, and I know that because I love rabbits. Here's a light bulb. So this test dates from 1917. How many people do you think would have had electricity in their homes? And more importantly, which segments of the population do you think would have electricity in their homes? If you've never been exposed to electricity, it would be pretty hard to complete this picture. And actually, nowadays we use different light bulbs, so I'm not sure which part is missing here. This is a letter. I have no idea what's missing here. This next row is about the violin. Again, an instrument that's quite expensive to acquire and not every segment of the population would have had access to such instruments in 1917. Pocket knife, I don't know what's missing here. A gun, again, something that you really have to be exposed to in order to know what's missing here. I have no idea what's missing there. We see some farm animals, uh, most of which you would find on farms, which were owned by white privileged Americans. And then here we see some sports, which were by and large played by white rich Americans. So I don't know which sports they're playing here or which objects they are missing. And you can imagine that disenfranchised people of color from 1917 would probably never have seen these games played. To sum it up, if we look at this intelligence test, it's very hard to claim that it measures inborn intelligence. It's much more likely that it measures familiarity with the dominant white culture of the time. And that means it has low content validity. So all of these conclusions about differences in intelligence between the different races are based on an invalid measurement. So results like these have been used in the past to justify racism. And if you pay attention to contemporary politics, this argument still crops up sometimes. But the problem is that the scales used have low content validity. 
they're not measuring actual intellectual ability. They're measuring a mix of intellectual ability and familiarity with a specific cultural context. And if we look at this specific intelligence test, we see that all of the items have a strong cultural component. They were administered during the height of segregation in the United States, where there was widespread institutional racism, which excluded black folk from white institutions, from white neighborhoods, from participation in white cultural activities, and from participation in education. So it's no surprise that marginalized populations scored lower on that test. I realize that that was some heavy subject matter. I do think it's important to address it though and make you critical participants of the debate about these topics. Just one more slide left in this presentation, and it is about criterion validity. And criterion validity just measures whether your scale correlates with, for example, an other validated scale of the same construct. So for example, if you've developed a short personality scale, you would want to check its criterion validity by looking at its correlations with a larger validated instrument like the NEO-PR, which is one of the most popular personality assays. You could also check whether your scale correlates with a behavioral measure of the construct. So for example, you would expect people who score high on a questionnaire of extroversion to also report having more friends and to report having gone out more in the past seven days. Similarly, you might expect an intelligence test to correlate positively with people's grade point average. And finally, you might expect a questionnaire of a specific construct to correlate with an outcome of that construct. So for example, if a questionnaire measures altruism, then you would expect higher scores to correlate with more money given to charities. That's all of the material for today. Next week, we'll get more into latent variables. Good luck with the tutorials and see you then.